Hello, everyone. Uh, today we'll look and compare uh, RESTful GraphQL and gRPC uh, with respect to how should you design your web API. My name is Jaroslav Šmolík. I've been for several years uh, designing and building web APIs, mainly as a backend engineer. I currently work as a tech lead at Oaks Lab. And uh, if you haven't heard of Fish Shell and are still using Z Shell or Bash, give it a shot. Uh, it is just like Zshell, but it works out of the box. Uh, this is my GitHub, my LinkedIn. I'll be happy if you reach out. So in the contents of this talk, uh, we'll first give a brief introduction to each of our champions. And then I'll go through each uh, of their superpowers and how do they compare in, uh, in reflection to each other. And then finally summarize on what should you use when and what are some things to uh, be careful about, and finally have some place for the QA. But if you have some questions throughout the talk, feel free to raise your hand and we can uh, do this uh, even throughout. So brief introduction into these three. They all solve the problem when you have these two set like nodes in the network and they want to communicate. One of them is typically server providing some API, and the other one is client calling the API. These three are not the only ones. There are some alternatives, as you can see. But I do believe like these three are relevant for you, and you should know about them, whether you're building like an MVP or prototype, or even like an enterprise application. Let's look into each one of those in a small detail. So REST, when you're designing a REST API, you're thinking about resources sitting at a URL. It follows something what is called a uniform interface. And what does it mean? If you look at the schema on the right, it is familiar to everyone in the room, right? And this is exactly what the uniform interface means. Everyone knows what post on cats does. And when you know one API, you kind of know them all, because uh, it uses this convention, and you can easily guess what's the semantics of each operation. And it's been along for some time with us, and it is using typically JSON as a transport, but it's not uh, a requirement. Another champion is GraphQL. Instead of thinking about resources, uh, you're now thinking about resources and how they're connected, so about data in graph and their relations. So this is kind of the mind model when you're designing the API. We don't have the uniform interface, and each API is different. But now we have a description of the API, and you can see what are the capabilities of such API. So on the right, you can see an example of a schema. And in the, you can see that there is uh, some enum definition. Then there is some cat definition. So this is the message that we'll be working with. And you can see the capabilities of the API uh, that you can do query cat by ID, and you'll get a cat. And you can, if it's a good cat, you can pet a cat. And uh, so you can see what the API does, what you need to provide, for example, ID, and you know what you're going to get is cat, and it's defined here. So there's this shift that now we have a schema describing the API, and you know exactly what is going to happen. And it uses JSON as a transport. And finally, we have our last champion is gRPC. Instead of thinking about data and relation, we're back to the basics, and we're thinking about some functions. You're just invoking some functions on the API. So it follows uh, something what's called remote procedure invocation. It also has a schema similar to GraphQL. And for the definition, it uses enhanced protocol buffers. You might know protocol buffers for some, from some MQ systems. So there's an extension to that that allows you to define services and their behavior. So the schema looks fairly similar. Again, we have some enum. We have some message, cat. It has similar fields. You can notice a slight difference that when we, for example, define a number, we don't say a number, but we say, hey, it is integer 32. Uh, and again, we have some uh, requests, responses. And then, instead of defining queries and mutations, we have a service. So we're clustering the functionality into these logical uh, things that are called services. And you can see the behavior is the same. We can get a cat or pet a cat. When you call the API in the client, you'll be able to see this cat service and invoke a function get cat. This will be typically code generated from the schema on your client. So no matter what's the API written in, if you're writing, for example, a Java client, you'll be able to generate Java class stop, whatever you want to call it. That's called cat service, because you can read it from the schema. You'll be able to initialize the service with some connection string, 
some connection details, and then you'll be able to call on it on the instant get a cat. What will happen is that the client will encode it using the description from the schema, the protocol buffers, into binary, and this is the transport that we're using. So instead of using JSON, we're using protocol buffers, and they get serialized into some binary format and get deserialized on the server, and same on the way back. You need to be able to decode the binary response to interpret the message. And one small caveat here is that uh, by default, it only runs on HTTP2, which has some implications. Yeah, and it was released by Google a year later after GraphQL was made public. So now let's look at the superpowers that we have. Superpower number one, server tells you what it can do. I told you that when you know one REST API, you kind of know them all. But if I just give you a URL, hey, this is my REST API, you have no idea where, what, what to call. You have no idea where to begin, right? Unless you have a documentation or you have some other implementation at place, you have no idea where to start. With gRPC, uh, the situation is slightly better because you have a standard that uh, allows you to communicate the schema. So if I give you a URL to the API, you can ask the API, hey, do you support sharing your schema through gRPC? I can tell you yes, no, and you can see what's there, which is great. The problem is that the standard is fairly complex, and it's still not implemented for some of the supported languages, which is kind of sad. And finally, we have uh, GraphQL, which has the same thing. It's not called server reflection, but introspection, and it's a simple standard that works. I'll announce winners in each of the superpowers, and uh, here, obviously, it is GraphQL. Superpower number two, you can curl it. You can open up a terminal, write something, and it calls the API. It seems trivial and banal, but when you compare all these three, it's, it's a superpower. With REST, it's perfect, because you don't need anything, just curl. You can write it from scratch most of the time, right? Because it's, for example, for get, it's super easy, and you can read it and modify it. Fantastic. For GraphQL, you can still curl it, but you'll probably not write it from scratch most of the time. But you can still, you can still read it, and you can still modify it, which is kind of cool. And you still need only curl. If you compare it to gRPC, uh, you're, um, you're going to be disappointed. Because we talked about the serialization of the protocol buffers. So unless you can write the binary representation of the protocol buffers by hand, you will not be able to curl it. Obviously, there's a tool called gRPC curl that you can install, and it does the encoding of the protocol buffers for you, so you can write them in human-readable format in some kind of JSON variant, and this will get transcoded. But you do need to have uh, the schema files, or the server needs to support reflection. Ta-da! Superpower number three. Client gets what they need. Imagine you're building an API, and you, for example, have a web client and a mobile client, and they want slightly different data. But the resource is still the same, right? They all need a cat, but maybe the web needs uh, the cat's mother's name or something, right? So with REST, you'll probably do some custom implementation, maybe do some kind of query string attribute that says, hey, maybe include this, include that. Maybe there are some standards. But by default, you uh, need custom implementation. With gRPC, there is a standard solution for selecting out only the data that you want. It's called, there are several standards, uh, in fact, but the most famous one is field mask. And basically, you can uh, ask, hey, this is a get cat request. You can see that I need to pass in the ID. And the server can say, hey, this call uh, supports masking. Uh, so there's a type, field mask, and it's basically an array of paths within the response. So as you can see, for example, I'm not interested in the color of the cat. I want only the name and the level. It's good that it's a standard. It's bad that you, in many languages, need to implement it yourself. And when you compare this, what I mean by that is that you need to manually unset these or not set these when you're mapping into the, into the response. With GraphQL, client declares what they need and meaning that they can traverse the graph. For example, notice this example when you can get a cat, get a mother who is also a cat, and you can get her name. Uh, so client declares what they need. You have field masking by default. If I just omit the name here from the client, 
I have to do like zero work on the back end and it works seamlessly. Uh, so field masking that works. You can do batching of the requests. So you can do, for example, two queries in a single, I could write here cat2 and have multiple queries in one single request. So that's batching. And there's also uh, federation with, uh, which allows you to aggregate multiple backends into providing a single API for your client. So it does not a surprise that the uh, GraphQL wins this one. Superpower number four, uh, streaming. When you call REST API by default, it's a very simple communication model. You send a request, and the server sends back a response. When I want to get a cat, I'll send a request message that contains, hey, get cat ID 42, and I'll get a cat back. Beautiful. Simple. With GraphQL, you have the same communication model for operations query and mutation. Client sends a request, server responds with a single message. Apart from that, there's also a third operation that's called subscription. And this is used for observing events or watching for changes. Client initiates the conversation with the message, for example, hey, let me know when cat enters room 42. And the ser this opens, uh, let's call it channel or any kind of communication thing. And you can listen to events uh, sent from the server. So uh, we have this new model in GraphQL. And finally, with gRPC, uh, we do have all the capabilities of the GraphQL, meaning we have unary calls, meaning one message, one, one request message, one response message. We have server streaming, which is a different name for subscription. Client initiates the conversation, and then a server can stream cats, or anything else if you need. Um, but we also can generalize it in the streaming for the client side as well. It means that client initiates the conversation and which opens a writable channel for the client and the client can send in subsequent messages as they see fit. And finally, server can respond with, hey, I got everything or, hey, here's aggregate of all the messages that you sent or something like that. And also you can do uh, the ultimate uh, nightmare of uh, every API that you can do by directional streaming, which goes like client opens up a conversation, and then depending on whatever your application logic is, uh, you can send messages back and forth, meaning the client has readable and writable channel uh, to work with, and the same the server, and each of them can quit the conversation. Winner gRPC. Superpower number five. It is uh, simple. Uh, it's a trivial superpower, but simple and boring things and easy things are great. And I thought about, I've implemented all of these and I know that gRPC is kind of difficult, but I didn't know how much. Uh, so I did some kind of thought experiment and I thought, if you take a junior, this opinionated kind of <laughs> idea, but if you take a junior engineer that has, for example, one year of experience, no Python, and has never written a web server. And you ask them, hey, please, implement this simple API that returns a random cat, right? And you ask him to do it in REST. And parallel universe, you ask him to do it, or her, they, in uh, GraphQL. And the third universe, you ask them to write this in gRPC. How much time will it take? For REST, it will take three and we can think mandates. Let's say in three mandates, uh, this junior developer will be able to come up with a server prototype. With GraphQL, it will take him five mandates because he probably needs to do most of the things that he did for REST, but he also needs to learn about the schema, about some kind of niche things going on with GraphQL. And they also need to uh, kind of learn about how resolvers work so, and the orchestration. So there's some added complexity there. And when you finally do gRPC, it will take them seven mandates, roughly. And the reason for that is they need to learn the schema, which is a little bit further away from JSON. So it's a little bit more difficult to think about if you don't have any background in any kind of system language, for example. Uh, you cannot really debug it on the network, because all you see are, is one single HTTP2 connection with some frames in between, and obviously binary encoded payloads. <laughs> 
and you don't know how to call it because you cannot curl it, and there's a limited number of resources on the internet. I mean, there's a lot of them, but compared to GraphQL and REST, uh, it is ridiculous. So, <laughs> so that's it, and the winner here for the simplicity is RESTful APIs. Superpower number six. It's blazing fast, as everything is nowadays. So this will be a quick one. For REST, there is very little overhead that you need to, that is enforced by the protocol itself, right? Because it's just status codes, methods, and paths, like not much going on. Uh, it's okay when well designed, but has problems with overfetching and underfetching when you need to support multiple clients or when um, kind of the API changes or the client changes, right? With GraphQL, uh, there is some application overhead because you need to orchestrate the resolvers and you need to, uh, you need to, uh, sorry for that, you need to parse and interpret the query. But there are some ways to mitigate that. And with gRPC, you're at a perfect place and it should not come as a surprise because one of the design decisions behind gRPC was to make it efficient and performant. And there are two major, uh, benefits. One is the efficient encoding, when you can get really, really detailed if you really want to. And the other one is low network overhead, because an API call is not really one single HTTP request, but the HTTP connection is reused, and the individual calls are within HTTP2 frames. So the winner here is gRPC. Now, that's all for the superpowers. Now, a quick summary. With REST, you probably want to use it when you're implementing public APIs because everybody knows it. It's fairly easy to do. You can call it without any library. Great. Uh, when you're building a simple uh, uh, create, read, update application, ideal because everything is supported there. And if you want to use some HTTP standards such as, I don't know, ETAG, if modified, sense, and whatever, great place because you have this direct connection and this very close relation to the HTTP. You should avoid it if you don't intend to write documentation at all. There are some ways to make it easier for you, uh, but the setup is not as, I would say, straightforward as, for example, with GraphQL when you have the schema at hand. And by the way, uh, if you're struggling or thinking about, hey, has anyone implemented this thing? Google has a very extensive guide on uh, that is applicable for both gRPC and RESTful APIs. Uh, it's called AIPs. I believe it's API Improvement proposals, if I'm not mistaken, an API design guide. And basically, if you're thinking, hey, how do I do masking with REST? How do I do pagination in REST? How do I do X, Y, Z? How should I name this? This is a fairly large and consistent guide. With GraphQL, you should probably use it when you're having a read-heavy application and you can really utilize uh, the graph queries and traversing the graph from the client. Or when you have some situation, as I said, BFF is uh, uh, backend for frontend, when, you're want, when you have different clients that have different needs, uh, with the default out of the box, GraphQL gives you the best start that you can have. Um, when should you avoid it? I believe when you have no experience with GraphQL and you're rushing off to production, uh, you should maybe reconsider. Uh, it's fairly easy to start with a prototype, but there's a lot of niche things that you kind of need to know or research or learn uh, to run it in production, especially if it's a public API. Uh, think about monitoring, think about uh, preventing some uh, basic attacks with the batching. Uh, think about implementing mm, the graph queries on a relational database. There's a lot of things that you'll figure out that, hey, I should have known this. So uh, great tool. There's a lot of things that you need to learn to run this efficiently in production. And uh, by the way, if you're looking for some resources, uh, GitHub Graph uh, is a public uh, graph that you can traverse. It has several thousand slides of code, and you can see it's fairly consistent, nice, and so on. And finally, gRPC. You should use it when you have a use case for streaming, uh, when you need the optimal transport, or uh, yeah, or when you generally need uh, the low network overhead. It's ideal for backend to backend. And you'll kind of decrease the difficulty if you're already familiar with the protocol buffers or if you're using Golang because the support there is great. You should avoid it 
if you need browser support because you need to run a proxy, and if you're building public APIs because nobody knows how to call it. And uh, by the way, all Google APIs uh, use gRPC. Uh, so if you have ever used gCloud, uh, any kind of uh, Google Cloud API, Firebase, uh, all of that uses gRPC. So uh, that's it. There are no winners and losers. As Tolkien said, API protocols like threats in their tech tapestry find their worth in their weave, meaning you can use them all wrongly. You can use them greatly. It all depends uh, for you making the best choice. And hopefully, uh, this content brought you a little bit closer uh, to navigate in that waters. So that's it. And now, if there are any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. If not, thank you very much for your attention.